Hey, welcome to the channel. In this video, we're going to look at how to start a new Ruby on Rails 7 project using Hotwire and Tailwind CSS. More specifically, we're going to look at how to filter out features you don't need when you create a new project, what are some of the features you can choose from, how to create a minimal Rails application, and how to make sure Hotwire and Tailwind CSS are working by building a basic counter. My name is Caesar, and I've been using Ruby on Rails since 2008. At the time, it was a game changer, especially for startups trying to launch a product to the market with a small team and a tight budget. But in more recent years, its popularity has declined with the rise of single-page application frameworks like Angular, Vue.js, and React. But with the release of Hotwire, namely HTML over the wire, it seems that Ruby on Rails wants to change the game once again. It all makes sense. For one person or very small teams, building single page applications where you basically write two different projects for one feature is not cost effective. Especially if you can get 90% of the way there in half the time and with half the team size. That's gotta be important for a lot of people. But the only way to find out if Rails is gonna revolutionize the web once again is to wait and see. Okay, so let's look at some code. The Rails new command has a bunch of options that you can choose from. The dash dash skip namespace option we can ignore because it has to do with creating Rails engines and their namespacing. The second option, dash dash skip collision check, is used to make sure you don't override existing classes. This doesn't apply when creating a new project. It's a flag for other generators like models and controllers. The Ruby path flag we don't really care about too much. It should be set to the correct path if your Ruby version is installed correctly. Now the dash m template flag is interesting. If you find yourself creating Rails projects often, you might want to create a template for yourself so you don't have to do a bunch of project configuration every time. Or you could use someone else's template if you find one that you like. In practice though, I rarely use this flag, simply because by the time I get tired of generating new projects, the Rails version has changed or my preference towards the gems I want to use have changed. And if I were to use a template, I would probably have to update it anyways. At least for me, the template feature is not that useful, even though it sounds cool to have it. Moving on to the dash D database flag, I tend to use this 50% of the time. Like if I know I'm going to really need Postgres, I'll set the database to Postgres from the start. But the other 50% of the time, I'll just leave it to default, which is SQLite. That's because my app is probably not going to need to bother with the Postgres dependency for a long time. And if I do need it later, it's easy to change. The dash dash skip git flag lets you do what it says. Namely, it doesn't create a .git folder and all its metadata for you. I don't know when you might use this. I personally never do. The skip keeps flag is used to skip creating the .keep files in empty folders. You would use this when you don't want to have empty folders committed to git. Because git cannot track empty folders, you need to have a file inside of them if you want to track them. So Rails generates those files for you. The skip action flags are used to skip the corresponding gems. They are self-documented, but if you need to know more, you can look up the documentation for each gem. The skip asset pipeline flag is used to opt out of using any asset management in your Rails app. So if you don't want Rails to handle the concatenation and compression of your JavaScript and CSS assets, you're free to skip it. The default framework for managing assets is Sprockets, but you can use something else with the dash dash asset pipeline flag. You can choose between Sprockets and PropShaft. PropShaft seems to be a new option. And from its GitHub page, I can see that it's supposed to be a replacement for Sprockets in the future. I might make a video about it in the future, so if that's something you're interested in, let me know in the comments. You can also use the skip JavaScript flag if you'd like, but I doubt that option is very useful unless you're building a Rails API. Then there is the option to skip Hotwire, which we won't do here because we want to see it in action. The skip JBuilder option is used to disable support for the JBuilder gem, which is a DSL for writing JSON structures. Now the skip test flag is something I want all the time, because I don't like using test unit, I prefer using rspec instead. Next up is the skip system test flag, which if you're using skip test, it has no effect. All it does is it skips the generation of the system test folder. The skip bootsnap flag is used to skip the bootsnap gem, which is used to make your Rails app boot faster through compilation caching and path pre-scanning. If you ever want to use a local version of Rails, you can use the dash dash dev flag and specify your local path. 
If you'd like to use the main branch of Rails' official Git repo instead, use the dash dash edge flag. There are also dash dash main and dash dash master flags to do the same thing. You could also put all these configuration options in a file, and you can specify that configuration file on the command line with dash dash rc flag. If you don't want to put the options in a project file, you can put them in a file called .railsrc in your home folder. That way you can use the same options on all your future projects. The dash dash API flag can be very useful if you're building an API only project. It strips away a lot of the unnecessary layers that the full stack Rails app would need. If you want to learn more, you can check out the official guides. I'll put a link in the description. The dash dash minimal flag is just a shortcut for skipping a few features that you can see here. The dash dash JavaScript flag allows you to configure different JavaScript bundlers and transpilers like Webpack, ESBuild, ImportMap, and Rollup to integrate nicely with the asset pipeline. Also, with the dash dash CSS flag, you can pick up the CSS processor you want. In this case, it's going to be Tailwind. And finally, the last feature in the list is Skip Bundle, which allows you not to run bundle install after generating the project. Maybe you want to add a few more gems to the gem file or anything like that, so that flag is useful sometimes. So let's generate a Rails app. I'm going to use the skip test flag to get rid of test unit, the JavaScript flag with the ES build option, and finally the dash dash CSS flag with a tailwind option. Once the project is created, we can CD into it and start the web server with the bin dev command. This command will run the web server and two other processes for watching the JavaScript and CSS code. Once you see the line that says listening on port 3000, you can open up the browser and look at the home page. If you can see this home page, it means your Rails app is working. But let's see if we can use Tailwind CSS with it. The first thing we need to add is a controller, an action, and a view. Then we need to also add a route for the home page. So in the sitecontroller.rb file, we have an index action. And in the corresponding view file, namely the index.html.erb file, we can put some Tailwind classes, just to confirm that Tailwind is working. Now, if we refresh the browser, we can see those Tailwind CSS classes in action. Cool, so Tailwind CSS is working. But what about Hotwire? How can we make sure Hotwire is working? If you've never used Hotwire before, it's an improved way to build reactive web applications without the complexity of writing and maintaining both a single page application and an API. It's a full stack solution that allows you to write your application logic in one place and enjoy the speed and responsiveness of a single page application all without having to write any JavaScript. Okay, so to see it in action, we first need to create a turbo frame. The turbo frame is used to update parts of the page independently of the rest of the page, and you can have more than one turbo frame on the same page. But for our purposes, one turbo frame is enough. The turbo frame tag helper generates the necessary HTML, namely the turbo frame tags, that will be picked up by Hotwire. So if we look at this page generated source code in the browser, we can see it created a turbo frame tags and it put the counter ID on the tag. The ID will be used to identify and update the turbo frame. Now let's add an initial value to our counter. We can use the src option and the path where the initial value will be fetched from. Then we need to add that action which checks for a counter param, and if it doesn't find one, it returns one. Otherwise, it increments the counter. We also need a route for the increment action. As to what the response will be, we'll put that code in the increment.html.erb file. So this view will use the incremented value of the counter and it will display it in a different color every time we render the action. The rent color helper here is just generating a random hex code. And on the next line, we render the increment button again with the new counter value. Lastly, we add some padding to the layout file so that our page contents are somewhat centered on the screen. And now we can go ahead and test it. As you can see, every time we click the button, a request is sent to the back end, which responds with HTML, not JSON. And inside that HTML, we can see the turbo frame with the counter ID and the new content for it, which replaces the existing content. So there you have it. That is how you set up a basic Rails 7 app using Hotwire and Tailwind CSS. I hope that helped and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to be notified when I post new videos. Also, if there is any particular topic you'd like to see on the channel, let me know in the comments. Bye!